Okay, I, I checked. I did, I did quick check earlier. I'm going to check it again. Anybody here have used Python more than five years? Ten years? <laughs> Fourteen years? Okay, yes. Okay, only both of us have been around for lo- old enough. Okay, <laughs> so a bunch of old guys. And then we have a bunch of old guys in Python world. So I'm currently okay. My name is Izhar. Uh, currently the head of data engineering in this company called Abirise. We do. A lot of this Hadoop thing, big data thing, those kind of things are more on engineering side, less on the science and analytics side. Uh, so been doing open source for like since 2005. Python, I've been using it since 2006. Professionally since 2009, so I've been around with Python for quite a long time. Uh, and I tend to work on the obscure stuff on Python, which where every time I go around, try to find people who use the same thing that I use. Good luck, can't find. Uh, uh, so. <coughs> and also contribute to number of open source projects, especially Fedora. If you have guys, any Fedora user? Any people have used Fedora Linux before? Use, use, used, use, uh, not, use. not, not like uh, a <laughs> <like> computer Ubuntu. <laughs> 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 okay, and then this, uh, and then that, that was where I started more in contributing to open source. And then after that, I start my own company with this guy called Kara Yusof, right? The currently doing Sina project. So we, during that time, we were doing this uh, content management system or document management system called Plone. And that is a, a very powerful CMS written in Python with an object database instead of, instead of what do you call it, instead of normal RDBMS. And during that time, I learned quite a lot of things, uh, especially more on the fancy object-oriented design patterns and whatnot. And one of the strengths in Plone that time is that it's very pluggable. So you can really compose uh, uh, an application by just installing, by, by composing multiple content types and it turns out into an application and you and what content type that you create is can be reused in other projects and i really 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 like that and how, why it have why it become why it can do it is because it's this underlying framework called zope so those who have been around in python for a long time will know that zope is just like the first web framework for python like who use zope <laughs> so i tell you what obscure stuff eh? who use zope who ever touch zope who ever read any library that you use that import zope.components? This one, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can use, use zope. So, uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, so, and then, I also nowadays, a little bit, I contribute to this project called MOPA. It's another flask light web framework, which is, uh, which bring along a number of idea from zope. Okay, so, is a, currently is the only framework out there that really give me the composability of Zope. Uh, then there was one project I did with a more fast uh, original creator. Uh, this of VL Java JavaScript object object view element link, uh, framework, which was we used for one project for some Dutch Dutch project. Uh, but it doesn't ta- it doesn't take off. It was very similar to Vue to certain degree, but it didn't take off. Uh, so been developing Python since 2005 or 2009 professionally and blah 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 blah. Okay, so why yet another web framework? It is usual question I will probably will, will get. Uh, so, being coming from Zope, I tend, uh, I, I really like composability because I found it frustrating when I need to, every time I need to create a new project, I know I've done something similar in a different one and try to bring it in into a new project, it just couldn't. It's all hard or just a lot of work. Or if I want to assign a junior to do it, good luck. <laughs> okay, uh, so why so why can't we just develop one module once and import it to another project, not copy, import. Okay, not copy the code, just import. And then if I just want to change some business rule, can just override that portion only, while still maintaining the main code base, not untouched, and you can have a maintenance site on that part on its own, and have a way to override whatever rules that I registered on top of it. And then another part thing as uh, nowadays I build mostly enterprise applications, uh, and usually for data engineering purpose. Okay, when you're doing data engineering, there's one thing that you always regularly have to handle: prioritization and job scheduling. 
Because say for example, you want to schedule a SQL, you want to run an SQL job that takes half an hour to run. Okay, and how do you uh, have your application being able to trigger that without blocking the I/O? <laughs> okay, and also on the same time, say for example, if you build a chatbot, when you receive a chatbot from Telegram, a chat message on Telegram API, if you just build a simple uh, web 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 server, what happened? Python is single threaded. Eh, not single threaded. Single block to a single core because of the jail. Huh? Okay. So when that particular piece of code. It's, it's taking some time to understand the tags and whatnot to, before it can return a result. Another message comes in and it didn't get processed because of that. So how do we make sure that I can run asynchronous distributed jobs and then on the same time schedule jobs that run in background once an hour or once uh, uh, a day or something to aggregate pre-aggregate data, prepare data, masak data and whatnot. Okay, <coughs> so usual hack to do scheduling when you do a web application, what you do? You have a PHP file, you have a URL, and you have cron that wget that URL. This is usual hack people will do. But I found that it's a bit ugly. Yeah? Uh, and then when it comes to distributed job, things can get a bit messy. Uh, so, and another part is this. Uh, because also I'm doing a lot of this data work, I have this situation where when I create a data model, like say a content, uh, 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 like a, pro a project has multiple data model, right? One of the data model may not reside in SQL may reside on a different database because it's more optimized there. Say for example, this table in MySQL. Another, tab another table is in Mongo because it's better to store this information inside Mongo. And another table is inside Elasticsearch. But I also want to have a single nice API that communicate to all of that that is standardized. I don't want to be talking to the specifics of this when I want to uh, filter and whatnot. Lah. Uh, and of course, what I mentioned again when it comes to, when you want to start to reuse application, reuse modules, you notice that you need to override certain implementation specific for that project. So you build a, like a calendaring system for, for, uh, for project A, you want to import the same calendaring system, but maybe change certain portion where how it decide on what calendar to display. Only that small portion only without changing the rest of that code. So, so I want to be able to register new components out of that. So this is the reason why I end up writing uh, this mod framework. And, and when, I, when I was on Plone, all this was easy. But when I want to pick up Flask, I notice that this get difficult, uh, or just too much work. Uh, just too much work, especially I'm mo my team is very very small, and we are deadline sensitive <laughs> most of the time. Okay. Uh, so in the beginning there was this framework called Zop. So those who have been around for a long time probably have heard of this. <laughs> uh, Zop? Have you used Zop? Have you have you ever heard of Zop? <laughs> okay, so uh, the Zop have this portion called the Zop component architecture. It makes it really, really easy for you to write composable systems because all, all this composition. And there was this clone that's mentioned earlier where it it brings Zop to the next level. It's a nice platform for me to quickly build application. If I want to build a quick prototype application, just get one content type, deploy on clone, I get a nice UI and whatnot all there because it's inherited from whatever the base system already have it. Uh, however, uh, for, for today usage, Zop is big, old, and gunky. Uh, because one of it, I would say, because of its database. Zop doesn't use RDBMS by default. Zop uses Zop object database, which basically a, 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 a database where you just instantiate your class object, you dump it to the database. You don't think about uh, encoding it to SQL or whatever. You just throw the Python object into the database and it remembers it. It's basically a very big dictionary that persists. <laughs> it's a very big Python dictionary that persists on disk. So if everything that you put inside the Python dictionary will just stay. It's cool, it's make it easy to develop things, but also it's a maintenance hell sometimes. And trying to get new people to understand that, understand how GeoDB works, good luck. <laughs> okay, uh, and too heavy for most application architecture. So I, and every time I try to pick up Flask, I try to pick up Django, I found myself creating Zope again. I guess it's just I, wait, why why is it end up doing that again? So then uh, I try to find alternatives. So one of it is uh, been around for a while is Pyramid. Pyramid is actually built on top of Zop punya Zop component architecture. But even though they have that capability of Zop component architecture inside Pyramid, that API layer is mid hidden because they are they are trying to make it make Pyramid more popular to Django guys. They are trying to put more Django guys. So that layer of API of Zoop component architecture is being made hidden deep inside the Pyramid. So if you want to make use of it, 
it's a bit tough to pull it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then uh, this Martin Fasen, the author of a grok framework, which is based on Zoop, uh, who also I worked with for about a year for some project in Netherlands. Uh, he built this framework called Mopath. So it's more similar to Flask. It's a very lightweight, low-level framework. Uh, and then he rewrite, he re-implement the Zoop component architecture library in a simpler manner that doesn't pull the rest of Zoop dependencies. And they call it, he call it Rack. Okay, so it's a nice library for component for component programming. Uh, and then on top of that, he built this library for you to to do decorator-based component registration called Dactate. Uh, so <coughs> when I saw that, okay, this is something that I've been looking for. So then, so then uh, suddenly we got a project for cybersecurity Malaysia, and then uh, I decided, so can I just use more path to build this project because of the Zoop-ish thing? And while doing that, I noticed myself start to build the content type layer on top of more path. So more path is plus light. It's a very basic bare metal. It doesn't decide on which storage for you to use. It doesn't have any sort of content type system. It just gives you the hooks for you to write application. So, so I, I noticed that I start to build a content type system and a CRUD engine on top of more path. So then they said, okay, let's just form this up to become a new framework <laughs> that is built on top of Mopa. So that's where the mock framework comes uh, into being. Lah. So feature-wise, uh, one of it, so when you want to start using Mopa, you can instantiate it using uh, the te a template, uh, template command. So this one just something similar to uh, create your skeleton first. Lah. Okay, so just go next. So when, once you instantiate your project, you'll be able to run the, uh, apa nama? To, to start up the REST server by using the mob uh, FW command. So, bootstrapping is a bit easy because you can just immediately uh, instantiate using this. And when you want to start, I can just start it off uh, with that command. So, by default, this command will spawn a GUnicorn server. So, it can handle multi training by default to a certain degree. Lah. Okay? Uh, so, then the most interesting part of Mob is that it uses content type system, and Mopath, Mopath and Zoop have this style, have this thing where you you don't attach your view to the application. So when you do Flask, you define view, and the view will load up your model, and then you print the view, you display the view inside, uh, you display the temp, the template, you return the template from the view. But in Mopath and in Zoop before, the view is always attached to a model. The URL route publishes a model to a URL. And whatever view attached to the URL will be follow the model. So in a way, uh, a view is an adapter to model. So those who are familiar with the terminology of like, uh, nama? the gang of four design patterns. So a view is an adapter to model. A view transform a model to become, to display in a certain manner. So you have an edit view of a model, uh, display view, listing view. Okay. So and good, and, and then uh, a model is published on a path. Okay? So your routing, you don't you don't route to you, you don't route to view, you route to model. Okay? That's a bit different there. And because of its route to model, you can bring your model around to different projects and whatever view that is attached to the model, you can bring it along together. Okay? And um uh, and what and when it's, if there's a model that if there's a new model class that inherit the model that you create earlier. It will bring together. It will inherit also all the views that come with the parent model, and then you can override that view. So that makes uh, re to some degree re reusability more 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 easier lah. Okay. So <coughs> so to create a mod uh, content type, what we call it, uh, is that uh, you can use this command called mfw template to create resource. They will create you the skeleton of temp of uh, content type. Okay. And this is just a simple piece of code that will give you the default schema, a simple schema, a simple collection model, and then a simple object model, where uh, by default it uses SQL Alchemy, but you can swap it with different storage. Okay, uh, and then the default block storage is FS block storage. Okay, uh, so content type definition looks like this. So for schema, we use uh, the data class library to build our schema. So the reason, the thing I like, the reason why we use data class library is this: because data class you can parse. So what what we have internally inside the system is data class library par, com, compiled to Colander class and use Colander for do schema validation. 
Okay, and then uh, something that I've been wanting to wait for a while is that the data class library can also be, in theory, compiled into SQL Alchemy model, and then and then use that for the model lah, rather than writing the model itself. But at the moment, we haven't done that yet lah. We only have uh, data class to colander, and data class to just an object. <laughs> okay, so internally we have that, and then uh, to define a collection, it simply inherit the mock collection, and that's it. And all the view of a collection, which is search, create, it will be there, and aggregate. Uh, and then a normal uh, page model. And if you notice here, there's a block field. So whenever we I do project, I always have this problem of allowing blobs in the project and making sure blobs are properly controlled access. So to properly control access to a blob, you need to make sure that your application itself serves the blob rather than a, a secondary a secondary web server. Right, because some people will just point a URL in S3. But that one, if somebody get the URL, they can always fetch it. But if you want to control access to the blob, you need to make sure that our application serves the blob. But the problem with that, a lot of junior programmers don't know how to serve blob properly. So what, we have, what they will do, they do a file.open the blob, dot read will be bring all the binary into the RAM, and then it will send it out. That's that, that big trouble. So I decided to bring in blob management internally inside this inside the system, so inside the framework, so that you don't have to it, by default, you're already serving it streaming manner by block of one megabyte. So that way, you don't end up with memory uh, peak. Lah. Another question that usually pop up when you are trying to store block inside your project. Do you store block inside your SQL database? Do you store block inside a file system? Do you store block inside a file system? How do you manage it? How do you curate it? How do you manage the relationship and whatnot? So the model system inside Mopath, uh, no, the storage engine actually, uh, ha have, have a block extension. So by default, it will store inside a file system, which you can put that file system folder inside a shared folder or something. So it only serves from the file system rather than storing it inside database. Okay. Uh, so this is the SQL Alchemy model, and this is storage engine. So by default, uh, uh, SQL storage. Uh. So route registration inside uh, Mopath, no, Mop, Mop, Mopath, okay, uh, is using like this. So I, I mentioned earlier that a route is mapped to a model. It's not mapped to a view. Unlike Flask and whatnot, so this model is published in slash pages. Okay, and this model is published in pages with ID. So you just uh, reduce, uh, return the collection or return the uh, exact model lah. Okay, and Mopath as the underlying framework that we use, the Mopath framework uh, allow also very complex access control, which will can set model level. Every model can have different SEL. So this is built-in feature inside Mopath. And not mop. Okay, so once you create a content type and you deploy the application, by default, a content type will get these endpoints. So you already have your CRUD endpoints ready. Okay, so post to a uh, slash pages will create an uh, object inside inside pages, and then to read the object, just do a get. To update, you do a patch with what field you want to update. Uh, to delete. Uh, you can do a send just a delete command to do a listing of all the content available. You can search, do a, a search endpoint. And this search endpoint, there's a we have a query language for you to put there. Then you can do for filtering. Okay, and then they also have an aggregate feature. So if you want to send an aggregate query to the database, I want to get just aggregated result. The aggregate endpoint can do it. Say in this case, aggregate question mark group count by UID year created. So group by created and count. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so once you create a project, by default, a uh, content type will have its own set of views. And sometimes you want to override the view. Say the you don't like the default search implementation. You want to you want to replace it with your own implementation. So what you do, you register a view, which is this one in this case a JSON view on the collection or on the model that you are trying to change. Uh, implement back the name of the view, and then uh, do whatever you want. So then you can override. So you are not bounded with a CRUD, the built-in CRUD engine. You can always override uh, on your own to to make to make things your way. Yeah. While at the same time, still reuse your old your old project. Okay. Uh, then uh, every content type has its own storage engine. By default, we use SQL storage, which is powered by SQL Alchemy. We also have an ES storage, Elasticsearch storage, where it will store the re records inside Elasticsearch. Uh, there is some limitation of that one, like aggregate, I think I cannot do aggregate on that one. 
Uh, and then also when I'm developing to make sure that I can decouple the storage, there is an implementation of memory state. We just store inside dictionary in a, in a machine. Uh, so a single app may have different content type that is backed by different storage. So maybe you can have like one table is in HBase, another table is in SQL, another table is in Elasticsearch. So you can actually, in theory, do that. Lah. Uh, I haven't tested it properly yet, but let's see how, what happens. So as I mentioned earlier, the block API. So every content type may have blobs attached to it. By default, it's actually an annotation to the uh, block, the main content object. So you can just post or get to a, to a slash block view on your, on your model. So we have made the blob serve in a streaming manner. So that way, it don't cause RAM issue. Lah. So I do have plan to have a S3 block storage later in the future for cause uh, once once we have some project that you need that <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so composability so views are coupled to content types uh, so view will follow the content type and it's always overridable and it's also inheritable you can inherit views and then do whatever you want and it is a form of adapter components and all these other components like storage engine and whatnot these are all technically are just adapter to the content type okay so we also have a state machine. So usually publish, uh, reject, and whatnot. So you can also register a state machine to your content type, where you can define say for the transition, what transition approve uh, from from new to pending, destination to approve. So you can have a workflow like that, and it is powered by py transition library. So if you want to know, so you can do by on on approve do what, on reject do what. So just register against your model object and this is how you register it to the to the model lah. oh okay all right then those are the main content system so the content system behave in that manner with a rest, bunch of built-in rest api and another part as i mentioned earlier where i need to run scheduled jobs and i need to run job asynchronously outside of my main process so i noticed that every time i want to do that i need to bring in salary integrate it back and those are annoying Okay, so what we have inside uh, Mob is that I made that as first class citizen of the framework. So by default, you always come, you already come with salary integration. So you can just use a simple, uh, and then to do salary integration, there's three services you need to start. So you have the main, when you run start command, you start the web server. This will serve the REST API. And then there's another process where you can, instead of doing start, you do scheduler. You will spawn the job scheduler. This is technically the salary bit scheduler internally. And there's a worker, which is technically is a salary uh, async workers. So to start the scheduler, you do mod from settings, start scheduler, and start the worker. So this one you can deploy on different machines for scalability purpose. Uh, so how do you define scheduled job? It's as simple as this. You do your app. You want to run a job that runs every five seconds. Uh, set a name for it, and then after that, seconds five. So this is cron like You can do seconds, minutes, hour, every five hour, every five minutes. Run this function, and it's, there's a there's a mock request here which you can get your application context. You can get the application object, so that you can do you can develop this as if you're developing a view. Okay, same goes to uh, if you want to run it every 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 minute, you can do a uh, cron cron style. This is cron style. This period is cron style. Okay. So this uh, scheduled job, so what you do, you just write your application, create a periodic job, create a cron job, uh, and then start the scheduler, start the worker, with uh, of course with the configured broker in between, then it will just run on its own. So, so there was a question earlier before we start, say, can, we, can we use this to develop non-web application? Yeah, I can, because if it's a scheduled job, it just run, the rest, of, the rest server you don't have to run. You just run the main, <laughs> just run the scheduler and run the worker, and it's just a scheduled job scheduler. Uh, so, it is also possible for you to submit an async job. Say, uh, you subscribe to a signal, test signal. Okay, this one handler, another handler. So you can have two handlers listening to an event. And then inside your view, you can dispatch an event. And this what happened is that when inside your view, when you dispatch an event with, uh, with this data, this data is sent to both uh, handler, and this handler run on the worker. So they run in parallel. And it's possible for you to also get back your result uh, from, from the finished job by using a dot get. So it, make, it makes uh, writing distributed job a bit easier. 
because it's already built in inside the framework. Else, you need to integrate salary in yourself. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's are other advanced feature like search provider. Say, for example, you want to have your model inside SQL Alchemy, your main data inside SQL Alchemy, but the search function you want to run it against against Elasticsearch. So you can override the search implementation by registering a search provider, or you can override the aggregate information by registering the aggregate provider. And that's also the asynchronous signal part. Lah. So stability of the API wise, uh, at the moment we are at 0 0.2. Uh, I was doing one project for the cyber security where I released 0 0.1. That one is a bit, we don't, we don't touch that much because I don't want to break the application. Uh, but 0 0.2, right now, so right now we are in the, po in the process of figuring out what to polish because there's a number of decisions that we made in 0 0.1 that was like nonsense. Like naming convention, which doesn't make sense that much. So right now I'm just focusing on polishing back, removing things that is not necessary. Uh, and then getting the the code to be a bit more semantically understandable, <laughs> else it'll be a bit confusing. But uh, so that API wise, there's not much promise on stability, at least on the, the deeper API. But the surface API right now, I'm pretty much happy already. Yeah. The deeper internal API, the one I'm still doing a little bit of cleanup on that code. Uh, so by the, uh, in the future, we plan to have an admin interface. So when you create a content type, instead of just re getting a REST, REST services, you should get a UI. We already have that somewhat there, but uh, I'm not sure if I can uh, if I have some screenshot. So, register content type, you get the listing view, nicely implemented with data tables, which you already have now. Nicely have data tables with uh, with with nice chunk based filtering, and then you have a edit view, uh, workflow view, on on every of your model. Very similar to Plone. So if you use Plone, you will notice that it's like heavily inspired by Plone, uh, and content. Concept map quite well to GraphQL, so I do plan to have GraphQL support endpoint inside the thing, which pluggable registration for GraphQL, and then also storage by end like S3 block storage, SB storage. But and what our long term goal is to be able to compose application quickly, because uh, we are not. I mean, as as, as me myself, and if I'm, usually the company I tend to work with tend to be service provider. They we build software for some other some enterprise companies and most of the time de deadlines is short okay and then the requirements that they request is tend to be very similar but with variations so uh, and I want to be able to say if I build a calendar system for example in one project I just want to import this change some rules then import this change some rules then I don't want to, to keep on re-implementing that over and over again and especially if a uh, deadline is short okay uh, so the there is another project it's called MobCC. So the Mob framework that I uh, I showed just now, this one this one is just a REST API layer. So the Mob control center is with UI. Licensing wise is a bit different. The Mob framework is in MIT license. MobCC is in AGPL. So this just be me being religiously open source. <laughs> so it's it's gonna it's AGPL. Uh, we build it on top of this Gentanella project lah to get the nice UI. Uh, the idea is, uh, I have when a person have an idea uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a of a product or something, right? I should be able to just create some content types for that product, uh, and then they can see the output quickly, and can quick, the customer can give comment quickly. Uh, because uh, when we were building the mock framework, we noticed that in a small team of five, separating UI and backend alone is already pain. It's, it's just too much pain. The, the turnaround time to get customer feedback is just crap. So we decided that let's just bring all the UI to the backend. I mean, there's no point to separate our front end and backend in a very small team. Okay, uh, so, and then if we do it in, do it in everything in the backend, then it's very easy. Uh, one security set and whatnot. Lah. Uh, so, CN development, but it's there and mock CC, the RTFD URG. And link wise, uh, you can read the documentation there. We have a Telegram group, so those who have tried around tend to be chilling around there. Uh, and the GitHub is there, mock framework. Okay, uh, how many minutes do I have left? Uh, how many minutes do I have left? If got some time, then I will show. Uh, show, 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 okay, 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 okay. Okay, uh, damn this crime. Uh, Wait, 
let me make some space. Okay. All right. I'm just going to. All right. Uh, let me just create a different project first. Ah. So let's just uh, create a different project. Uh, can you see or not? Oh, too, too low. Can you see? Ah? Make sure I bring it up. Okay. So if you install MFW template, you'll be able to generate your project by creating a project here. Say hello world. Uh, do the mock framework project first. And then done. Okay, then you go into your project. Eh. Okay. And then you need to install your project first ah, before you can make use of it. So pip install dash e for those who are not familiar will make sure that you install the current module inside the current directory and make it editable. If not, you install it inside your site package. Okay, so those who are not familiar with the dash e quite important when you're developing. So do a pip install dash e. So when you do that, okay, this hello world, we just go back to uh, the project. So when you do that, you will get this piece of code. So you get the you initiate an application root and then uh, create a simple hello world message on the URL. So let's just run the project. Okay, let me just go back to the uh, devel my project there. Lah. So, so here is hello world. So we want to serve it. So when it's generate, it'll generate this thing uh, settings.yaml. The settings.yaml uh, is where you configure where your port you want to use, uh, what's your server URL. This, this is important for the SQLiner job because when you're doing a synchronous job, it doesn't know what is the current URL. So you need to specify that. Uh, this one lists down the module to scan. So say, for example, if you have a different project that you have done before, you want to scan that module screen and import all together everything that was registered there. You can scan it together there. Uh, and then the database URL and where to store the block data. Okay. Uh, the authentication policy by default is just a user ID in the URL. Okay. And some JWT secret there. So, to so when it scans the project, it will look like when it scans the project, it will, it will load out whatever component is registered inside the module. Okay, merge is, is the main project. Yep. Uh, so to start it up, so you start it up. So now let me just open a browser. So if I go to localhost. 5000, I get SAD night. So default asset authentication policy just use ID, right? Use ID equals to dummy. Okay, so you get hello world. So this is the basic, which is nothing fancy there. Okay, then you want to create a content type for your project. So we do a MFW. Why is too low? Okay, MFW template, uh, create resource. This will allow you to initiate a resource. So give a name to the resource. Say, for example, page. And then the module name will be page. And then description. And then where the, where the URL of the model will be mounted on. So in this case, API v1 page. Okay. The main uh, UI mount. Oh, wait. Oh, no, this is, okay. Project type is more framework. Okay, then. The UI mount path there shouldn't be there. But anyway. Uh, so then, you can start. Then if I go here. If you go to API v1 uh, page, you'll see that you get the schema of the model, okay? Which is by default you have the ID field, UID field, creator field, created field, which is which record when the object was created, modified date, the current state of the object, the blobs available, alternate attributes, title and description. So when you see the code that was generated, it is just this. So I once you, when you initialize a content type, you'll get a page, page module there, and then uh, the model will be this. So this is uh, the model. The schema of your data is here. There's shut up. Okay, there's title and description. So you can add more columns there. <laughs> okay, and then the storage setting is here, which is. 
which leads down. So what are the this is SQL can be model lah, which means like usual. So then uh, define the storage. Okay, and some information of the type, and some metadata for the type, like the page type, the uh, factory, something like that. So if you notice here, there's no view dot py because it in inherits from the parent content type, which is the base model, which have all the built-in views. So just to go back to the model, so there's page model and and collection model. So collection is mounted in API v1 page. Okay, so the collection when you do a listing, you will get the schema of your object, which is in JSON schema, okay, and then you will also get links. So to create, you can do a post at this page, at this URL. To search, you can do on this URL, and to aggregate, you can do this URL. So now let's create a object. Sample request. So instead of content, uh, let's create page, right? Send this request. Then, so when you send a create request, this one in this case just submit title, set the title. It return back to you uh, the ID of the object, uh, the UID of the object, who the creator, the creator uses dummy, uh, when it was created, when it was modified, what is the state, whether it's deleted or not, and then title, and. It's a soft delete. Reason would be is that in my project, I tend to require soft delete regularly. So just screw this. By default, soft delete. So you can, then you can have a scheduled job. We will delete the uh, actual record. That, that one is faster also. Okay. Uh, so delete is soft delete. Yes, you're correct. It's a soft delete. So then you can get the, your, the object information here. Let me just copy this. So this URL equals to so this will get you the record on the object URL and if you want to do a, a update so you want to do an update so then just copy copy this URL and bring it here you can see ya uh, small user ID dummy uh, patch okay then I want to change uh, title to something else uh, okay so just run this request so they will update the content so when you want to view back oh. so you will see the value is updated so this is built in inside there. So in a way, it's also a it's a meta CMS, just a REST based CMS to some degree, right? Uh, so it's not yet CMS, it's just CMS. <laughs> it's a headless CMS, I right? headless CMS. And searching. So now I've created one record, so I can do on the collection level, I can do a plus search, which uh, user ID, which will list down all the. Records available. Uh, all uh, uh, top ten records. By default, the search limit is twenty, and you also have pagination respond there when the record more than the limit. So make life a bit easier on the REST API side, cause you just click content type. That's it. Uh, then on the and we also have something similar later, uh, which mob CC, which I'm not planning to demo today, but in mob CC in the slash page we get you a UI of that will allow you to list all the objects. And then uh, do edit and whatnot lah. So, any question? Right. Uh, 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 how would this compare with like GraphQL and things like that? Do you use it together? You use together because GraphQL, the Graphene library is just a, it's just a library. It doesn't do any, con it doesn't store data. It doesn't store. Uh, it doesn't have the. It doesn't store data. It doesn't have web server. It's just a way to parse the query and run some code. So I do plan to have a GraphQL endpoint later on on the main application, and I use a component registry to register more GraphQL thing inside. So because right now it's we already quite map. If you have content type GraphQL, so content type, and it's just a matter of writing the endpoint <laughs> to support GraphQL. Uh, for mob CC, let me just see if we can launch it. If we, I think we have time. Do we have time? 
apa pun workspace dokumen uh, yeah wait not so don't see all right so this one let's see Yeah, Q&A or whatever lah you want. 